We're here to make gospel-centered disciples of Jesus and to plant 100 churches in 25 years. As a body, we serve, we care for, we take care of one another within the body. We are to love Jesus. We want to live like Jesus, and we want to lead other people to Jesus. That's what this church is, is for. Good morning. Thanks for letting me be here again. I always wonder, you know, I feel like I try to leave a, an impressionable mark where I go. It's just a habit of mine. And I just always wonder, was it well received? Like, I talked a ton about Jesus in comic books, probably more than you were ever used to, if you, can, if you were here from the beginning. But uh, it's very nice of Jason uh, for you to be so welcoming and, and have always been up for saying, yeah, the City View Collective of Churches that we are committed to starting, we're always going to stay connected. We're not just going to planners out on an island. We're not going to let people by, be by themselves to figure things out by themselves. And so I've always just, since Jason told me in a Burger King in Missouri what he was thinking, I've always just liked the idea of planting multiple churches on purpose and doing something even crazier, planting what we call pregnant churches. And so, yeah, it's a weird way to say it, but when you think about it, it makes sense. But that's what we're about. We have this commitment. In 25 years, we want to see God plant 100 church plants through us in these parts of the Houston area that are exploding. And they need more churches because there's more people. What's very interesting is when Jason asks and you start thinking, well, what do you want us to talk about? And he says, you know, whatever you want. And you go, well, that's never a good idea. I need you to tell me what you want. That's how we always did it back here. You say what to preach and then we do it. But thankfully, and coincidentally, if you believe in that, we already had a plan for today. I wasn't going to preach today. Actually, it was my associate pastor, Matt, who's here. He was going to preach today, and we were starting a new series called Hope in Community. And we're talking about how to have hope in all the various forms of relationships we have to have as we go through this life, whether it's through church, through the neighborhood, through our work and school and through everywhere we are, the groups of people that we have to interact with, it seems like today we're losing a lot of hope that God could connect us in this way, that God could keep us close together, that there could be meaning and value in being a large family out and about, even though we're not actually related to each other. And so, graciously, Matt told me what he was going to preach on today, and I said, can I use that? And he said, sure. And so today's sermon was actually written partially by him. And so it'll be really good, I promise. Just sit tight. The other good news you have is I stayed up way too late last night watching the Astros game. And I'm super tired. So that just makes me want to get done faster. Okay? <laughs> so I'm glad you're here. And I'm glad you're letting me be here. So let's get into this. So I work, I volunteer over at a dental ministry in Alvin called Hope Dental Clinic. And we run into just kind of the worst cases of what society can do to people. Uh, if you come to our dental clinic and your teeth are this messed up, there's various reasons why they're this messed up and you need help. One, you just can't afford to go anywhere else. And the most we ever charge anybody for a dental procedure is 15 bucks. Two, you might have done a ton of drugs and it just ravaged your inside of your mouth and you want help to take away the pain. And then three, it's just a lot of really bad life choices that put you in a deep, dark hole. And it's funny how God uses this little clinic to just bring a little glimmer of hope. But what's funny is as we help these people who are in awful circumstances... And the stories I get to hear from these people are straight up like my nightmares for my life, like things I never want to happen to anybody. These people are like, no, that happens to me like three or four times a decade. And it's like, oh, awesome. I met a lady the other day who 
had the craziest story I'd heard, and I, I hear lots of stories, and I was kind of hoping I'd already heard the craziest, and then this lady came. But she once had somebody try to murder her with a gun, and she watched her brother actually get murdered, and she got shot, but she lived. Praise the Lord. But it was just like, what is wrong with this world? I never thought I'd meet somebody who actually like, had a hit out on them. I never thought I'd meet somebody who almost lost their life to a murderer. Yet here I am. And sadly, at Hope Clinic, this is becoming a regular kind of theme of just psychotic, evil things that are happening. I already mentioned the drug use. Gosh, so many people are doing drugs, and it's really bad, y'all. I don't know if you went to Just Say No in high school or middle school, but I feel like we should really stick to that as a society, but it seems like we're not. And you wonder, what causes somebody to get so low or bored or apathetic about their own life to go, you know what would be better? just chemically inducing a high because I can't naturally do it for myself anymore. And then to literally see him walk in and say, I literally gave up the ability to use my teeth to have this fake high on a regular basis. And what it comes down to is every time I meet these horrible stories, it comes down to at some point in their life, they lost hope. They gave up. They stopped caring about Could life actually have meaning? Could life actually have purpose? Probably not, so who cares? Eat, drink, and be merry. And sadly, I'm starting to notice Christians are starting to take on the same kind of apathy. They're starting to think this world is so far gone, our country is so far gone, our neighborhoods are so far gone, we should just give up and just focus on our little American dream of having a good living, a good home, a couple of cars, try to get the kids to go to college. And we'll just say that's the meaning to our lives, and that'll be our pursuit. What I want to remind you of today is that's not the point of this, of Christianity, of church. Sadly, what we deal with in Alvin is a lot of the people we meet there is they are what we call de-churched. They went to church for a while when they were younger, and something terrible happened by Christian people or people who claim to be Christians. They did something awful, sinful to them, and then they just gave up on it. They said, if Christians are going to act like this, when they get together, there is no point. There is no hope, and so they give up on church. And so what I want to remind us today is where we actually get our hope from. And what I really want to encourage you to do today is don't be the Christian that lost hope in the world or in church to where you think all I need to do with church is just come, sing some praises, get some Bible reading for my life so that I can just be spiritually happy the rest of the week till the next time I need to do it. That's not the mission of church. And there is no hope in thinking just church service Christian is all I need to be. That's not why we're planning churches. We're planning churches because Jesus is on a mission and he's called us to join him. And so that's what we're doing. And so I just want to remind us of those focuses today. I want to remind us of the basic things that we all need. So we're going to go to Revelation chapter 1. It's in the very back of the Bible. If uh, you're an Alvinite, it's on the YouVersion Bible app. If you have the Bible app, you hit the more button then hit events. City View Church will pop up, and you can follow along with service if you didn't get the actual paper one as you walked in. But we're going to be in Revelation chapter 1, and we're going to read part of the vision that John got. John, the the beloved disciple, the guy who wrote the book of John, who was one of Jesus' best friends, who hung out with him in some of the places where the whole John could go. And so we're going to see what he has. John, if you don't know his story, when he writes this, he's old and he's been kicked out of the country. They tried to kill him, couldn't kill him. So what they did is they just kicked him out and put him on an island as a prison so that he would be by himself forever till he died. 
And so what, he, what happened to him there is that he started writing books of the Bible. He didn't know he was writing books of the Bible. He was writing letters to churches he had started. And the last one he writes is the book of Revelation, where he gets this amazing vision of Jesus in heaven and what Jesus has planned for churches and for the end of the world. And so we're going to look at the very beginning of this and see just the beginning of what John saw probably when he lost all hope. Again, I want you to think about what it might be like as a missionary for Jesus to get kicked into an island where there is no people to be a missionary to, to be a prisoner, and then to receive a vision like this that he will then write down and send to seven churches. So this is what he says. We're going to read verses 4 through 8. John, to the, ch to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and is to come. And to the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and made us a kingdom of priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Verse 7. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him, even so, amen. And then verse 8, Jesus talks. He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. See, we live in a culture where it is actually kind of applauded these days to be like extra negative about everything around us and every person around us. Like there are literally people tomorrow who are going to get paid to be on TV to just be as negative as possible about the circumstances of our culture. And what's frustrating is they just want to bash on People in our society, people that God made in his image, they just want to bash them to no end because they disagree with them for whatever myriad of reasons, okay? But we are not people of the culture. As we read here, we are a kingdom of priests. We have a job to do, and it's not to be negative, and it's certainly not to complain. It's to get on board with what Jesus is doing. You see, we have hope. And because we have hope, we cause hope to happen to the culture. And we know hope is coming back. And that's what makes us City View Church. And that's why we're here. So let's get into it. I have three main points for you. I want to talk about our communities and the temptation to despair. I want to talk Jesus and contagious hope. And then I want to talk about a kingdom of hope that Jesus is causing through us. So like I've already said, our communities are looking to divide for whatever reason, probably sin, that's usually what we can always boil it down to, for whatever reason, people want to divide on everything to the point now it's affecting my comic book reading and I'm getting a little sick of it. You can't just today be a guy who likes all superheroes, you have to pick Marvel or DC and no one talks about like there's five other comic book brands out there. Don't get me started on this. You can't just say, you know, I really liked Avengers 3 and I like Justice League movie. They'll say, no, you got to pick one. Divide it. You can't even say that you like the new Star Wars movie anymore without causing controversy. I'm dead serious. And if you ever want to sit down with me and have a really stupid long talk about it, I'm up for it. I will buy the coffee. Let's, let's deal with it. But our communities all over the place are looking to divide, and I don't get it. They want to get into tribes and camps of thought to where they literally then want to live by fear of the other tribes and camps of thought. So our communities like to live by fear, afraid of all sorts of things. Guys, if you lived in Brazoria County this past year, there's lots of things to be afraid of. We had a stupid natural disaster. That's like going to be in the history books. We had an awful school shooting next door to Alvin. Awful. 
And I don't know if you're like me. I'm tired of being on CNN as a community. I feel like I intentionally moved to Alvin to not be in the national headlines ever. I really feel like people in Santa Fe really try to not be on the map. Yet here we are. And so because of this, if you talk to anybody who's not a church goer, and sadly a lot of Christians, there's a ton of people walking around today with a fear that something awful is going to happen again. And the truth of life is I can't say, yeah, no, we're good. We're done for the rest of our lives. We got all the major disasters out, so God's going to now spare us. I can't say that. I don't know. Communities are also looking to hate anything that doesn't agree. And so when you look at our communities who want to divide, who want to live by fear, and who want to hate, it's tempting for you and I to go, hey, we don't want to be like that, but because we see they don't want to change, we're going to give up on the communities that we live in. We're just going to give up on them, and what we're going to do is we're going to rally together around for our songs and our sermons and our podcasts that we like, and we're just going to try to isolate ourselves from the evil world around us, and we're going to be like super pure and holy together, and we'll never let the outside sinful world touch us. And in our minds, we go, yeah, that sounds right. That sounds like a safe way of doing. That's how we kind of raise our kids. We like to shelter them from all these things. Let's shelter ourselves from all these things. Scripture, sadly, does not agree. That kind of thinking, that despairing thinking, is not what Christianity is for, and it's certainly not what churches are for. And so let's get into it. Let's talk about Jesus and the contagious hope that he gives. In verses 4 and 5, if you want to go back there, Two big things that are going to stick out about Jesus is, one, he is from the beginning. He actually lived here, which, again, I always like to remind you, none of the major religions actually has the deity come to the planet and live here. But ours does. And then he's going to be around forever after time is done. So the first big thing we see in verse 4 is Jesus is beginning and end forever. Second thing that's big in there, see, he's the firstborn of the dead, which is such a cool title to have. To be, I'm the first person to die and come back to life like a boss. I would put that on a t-shirt if I was Jesus and I'd just walk around with it. I wouldn't say a word. First thing that you see, from the beginning to the end of time, the hope of Jesus never fades. That's what we sang today. The hope of Jesus, who he is, what he does, it's never fading. But Christian, you're thinking it is fading because of stuff you see on the news. And it's not true. The hope is infinitely strong, powerful, never stopping. It's like a train that can have a million things on the track and it's just going to run through them all. The other thing that we see in verse 4 is we have this faithful grace and peace that is always flowing from Jesus, and it never fades. Our eternal God, our Savior, our Lord Jesus Christ, he's dishing out faithful grace and peace. Let me just make sure you understand what those two words mean. Grace is this favor that we get from God, this kindness that we get from God that none of us deserve because of our sinful, imperfect ways. Our perfect God should punish us, but instead, he did this glorious thing with Jesus where he punished him to dish out to us this grace, which automatically gives you this peace from the Prince of Peace. It's this ability, no matter what the circumstances are outside, to feel the complete calm and security of knowing Jesus has the plan and we'll all be all right. Christian, I don't know what's happening in your life. I don't know what you're dealing with or struggling with, but I'm not in the sky. Everything's fine, Christian. No, everything's rough. I know that. In Alvin, life is rough. In Pearland, life is rough. If you've got to commute to Houston, life is super rough. But you should have peace in the rough. 
you truly are born again and you've truly received the forgiveness that comes for putting all your hope on Jesus in the cross, taking all your sin and zero hope on yourself, you should have what we call peace, the calm in the middle of the storm. The circumstances don't affect the calm inside the Christian. That's what we're taught. And then in verse 5, we're reminded of the hope of a resurrection that never fades. Jesus, with the cool title of being the firstborn of the dead and ruler of the kings on earth, him being the firstborn of the dead is the promise to you and I that one day we're going to die. Spoiler alert. But it's going to be all good. We are also going to be the second born of the dead. And we'll get to rock that on a t-shirt maybe if they have that in heaven. But we're going, we have this hope that even if this world goes to pot, even if this world burns down to the ground, it doesn't affect you and I. The hope of the resurrection never fades. It's as strong as it was the day Jesus got up and walked out of the tomb. It's as strong as it was when Peter and John realized he got up and walked out of the tomb. The hope of the resurrection is as strong as it's ever been. It's the same strength it was when the first churches started. But you and I are tempted to think, oh, our culture is getting so bad out there that there's nothing we can do of it. And that's just bull, scripturally speaking. It's just garbage. And I'm kind of getting sick and tired of looking at my brothers and sisters just despair that this world is sinful. Well, what did you think it was going to be? Did you honestly think, like, America was going to somehow be shielded from the effects of sins just because we had, like, a bunch of missionaries help start it over here? No. It was always going to be sin-filled, and it was always going to be our responsibility to take the hopes that we see here and take it to the community with the sin. Not ourselves from the sin. Not to isolate ourselves into a camp where we just hang out together and shelter ourselves from all the sinfulness around us. No, we're an outside-thinking church that goes outside. We don't meet in a church building. I, I give you credit. You're trying to get a church building, and I'm jealous. But we're an outside-thinking church. We put it on the name. We're always looking out. That's why we have a city view. Because we want to know what's happening in the community, and we want to be God's grace to the community. And that brings me to my third point, a kingdom of hope. That's what we are in verses 6 and 7. It says that Jesus made us a kingdom of priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. And behold, he's coming back, which is exciting. We'll get to that. Let's talk about what it means to be a priest. Priest is just a professional worshiper. A priest is one who's taught and trained through the doctrines of Scripture to be a professional worshiper of Jesus. And you might think, oh, that means we all got to get behind a mic and guitar and sing. No, no, no. We kind of screw up the definition of worship sometimes. We call it a worship service. We call them worship leaders. But that's just one way we worship is through praise songs about Jesus. Worship is literally any obedient thing you do to make Jesus look good. Any obedient command you follow in scripture, any obedient heart you take, whether it's to a neighbor, whether it's helping out a friend, whether it's helping out somebody on the side of the road that had a flat tire, all of these things that we do and are going to do are acts of worship. They're not just songs we sing, it's actions we take. And what a priest is supposed to do is expand the kingdom as they go along worshiping. So here's how we build a great church, here's how we plant more churches, is as we go and be Christians outside the church, the kingdom grows. And literally, every obedient and loving step you take for Jesus expands the kingdom forever. Every time you go out your door, every time you go to work, and every time you do something that is not self-centered but Christ-centered, every time you do one tiny 
foot print of love for Jesus outside, that worship expands the kingdom. And that is what City View Church I don't know why that keeps happening. but And here's what happens. As we go, we solve the community's problems. As we worship Jesus out loud in our lives, at home, at work, in the neighborhood, we solve the community's problems. As the kingdom expands, we solve the community's problems. As we take that love that Christ has for us and we give it to him outside where we are, Despair fades, hope grows. You see, we, as we go, we give Jesus glory and dominion. That's what verse 6 says. Again, let me explain what those words mean. Glory equals honor and respect and a healthy fear for our Lord, our boss, our God. So honor, respect, and fear. Here's what I mean. Guys, do you know who we pray to? Do you really know who he is? When we say king of glory, when we say king of kings, when we say lord of lords, when we start giving the titles out of God Almighty, creator of the universe, do you know what we're saying? We're saying the one supreme being over all beings, the one who built the galaxies, we're saying he is in front of us. And should we not approach him with a lot more respect and maybe trembling and fear of, wow, this boss is the boss. And if I screw up in front of him, if I make my life about myself in front of him, if I get too self-centered or too ego-filled in front of him, that perfect supreme being is going to be a little upset with me. And it's only a little upset with him because he's so loving and gracious. Do you know who we're praying to? And if you don't, you might think, you approach him in prayer next time because you might be rushing into it too fast. Solomon always gave this good advice in his Ecclesiastes. He says, don't rush into the king's presence like a fool. But go in kind of trembling. And he even advises, let your words be few, meaning do a lot more listening than talking. You know how to listen to God? There's a variety of ways, but the number one way is God always speaks through his perfect word. And his perfect word is the number one way he talks to us. He also talks to us from our Christian brothers and sisters speaking into our lives. He can also talk to you through your circumstances as you pray and ask him to reveal himself. But the number one way he talks is through the word. And sadly, I see way too many Christians around me trusting what the people on TV say about life than what they, the word says about life. No wonder they're in despair. Let's talk about dominion. Dominion is just a fancy word to say authority, strength. This is what a kingdom of priests are giving to Jesus. Glory, dominion, authority, strength. And again, all these things should humble you and I. Should cause us to think a lot less about ourselves and a lot more about the purpose of the king. You and I get too wrapped up in our own plans. You and I get too wrapped up into our own budgets. You and I get too wrapped up in what we desire our lives to be, and not wrapped up enough in, maybe we should stop, calm down, and just sit in the presence of the greatest, greatest king there will ever be. Maybe we should just sit and listen to the hope of the universe. And then as we hear him, then maybe we should decide some things about life. But until we hear from him, maybe we shouldn't decide anything major. You see, the only thing to be afraid of in this life is making our God angry through disobedience. It's the only thing to be afraid of. And that's why in the Old Testament and New Testament, you'll see over and over again, it says, fear your God. And you should be afraid of disobeying him because he, as a loving father, will discipline us. 
And I don't know if you were disciplined by your earthly dad like I was, but that was always kind of like a fear-filled thing. It's not that he didn't love me. It was just, man, he could really get a belt going fast. And it stings. I imagine the discipline of the father is very similar. I can give you some stories about how he's disciplined me over the years, but they're very embarrassing, so I won't. But I will tell you this. The number one way we can get on God's frustration list is through self-centered pride where we care way too much about ourselves and not enough about the king. The number one way to humble yourself is to empty yourself of everything that is you so that God can fill you emptied up all the way with himself. That's what real humility is. It's not saying self-deprecating things about yourself. It's about being just not concerned with you, only concerned with him. That's real humility. The other thing that we learn in verse 7 is we are anticipating his return. With real belief, and what I mean by real belief in Jesus is belief that causes you to act differently. With real belief that leads to new actions, which is how you worship God, That's how we anticipate Jesus coming back. Sadly, you and I don't think too often about his second coming. We we focus in the church about his first coming because that is what saves us. But his second coming is a big deal too. And again, I don't know why people get so up in arms like the world looks like it's going to pot. If you read all of Revelation, like that was the prediction. Like in order for Jesus to come back, the world gets worse. So, You should feel really okay that everything's wrong outside. That's what Jesus said was going to happen. So we should be cool with that. Anyway, with real belief that he's coming back, that should lead us to act differently. And if you truly believe he's coming back, you should care a lot about your friends, neighbors, families going to hell. That should be a real concern for you. That should worry you. That should keep you up late at night. That should cause you to toss and turn a little bit. Is that there is a world of lost people out there dying without Jesus. You're their only hope. God's called you to be a priest to them. So worship Jesus in front of them. And that should cause you also to have real repentance that leads to a humble purity. I'm not uh, Captain Awesome Christian. I'm not very good at this. In fact, Jason taught me a million times, I'm the worst sinner I know. He taught you the same thing, by the way. It's not just me. But I am the worst sinner I know. I know deep down what I struggle with. And I am an awful Christian. Like all the time. Like, I'm preaching to you now, and you might even be tempted to come up to me afterwards and say, boy, that was really great, and I'll go, yeah, but I I don't know how to do what I just said. I don't know how I'm going to pull this off either. But I think if I'm humble enough to say, dear Jesus, I can't do this. I can't bring hope to the community. I can't lead a church to plant more churches I can't lead myself to get out of bed to just pray sometimes. So what I'm going to have to do is say, Jesus, please, do what I cannot do. Teach me to worship outside. Teach me to think of myself way less than I do. Teach me to love my neighbor who is lost and is going to hell and lives a way that I wish my children didn't see. Jesus, give me the strength I don't have to do this job that you're calling me to do and say I can do. Jesus, do it. I think if we really repent of our prideful thinking, that would lead us to a new worship and purity of life where we act more like Jesus. And then what's interesting is he will then, by his power, his strength, give us the faithfulness that leads to joy-filled consistently bringing hope everywhere we go. So that brings me to our conclusion. He is our hope in verse 8. 
He just gives you a good reminder of who he is. He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. City View Churches, he is why we go to church. He is why we're here. He's why we're singing these songs. His ability to be the almighty, omnipotent, ever-present, perfect one being who created everything. He's why we do this. And he, as our hope, is why we plant churches. And he is why we're not in despair about our communities. We have all the hope in Jesus for the world. To lead the world away from sin. And to lead many people to himself. So brothers and sisters, I want to encourage you today. Yeah, the world's going to pot around us. Good news, you're here too. And you're a part of a church that believes God is using us to change people's lives. And so put your hope in him who had this plan 2,000 years ago to be doing all this that we're doing now. And stop worrying about what they're doing wrong. Stop focusing on the greatness of our God that we proclaim here at City View Church. Pray with me, please. Jesus, we cannot deny that you are the greatest. You are everything. You are perfection. You are all that we want. So God, I ask that you would forgive us for how we forget that. Forgive us for how we lose focus on that. And please change the way we think and change the way we care and change the way we hope. God, help us to not get fixated on what's happening around us, but help us to always be fixated on the greatness of you. Would you please come into our hearts and minds today And just make us care about what you care about. Help us to let go of what you don't care about. It's in Jesus' name that I ask. Amen.